a hot summer afternoon in the Northeast. Residents of New York and Toronto look forward to the weekend. No one could predict what is about to happen. Doors shut quickly at City Hall. Nobody was allowed in because the metal detector... Massive power blackout hit the United States and Canadian cities, closing seconds, nuclear power plants. 100 plans. power plants shut down and 50 million people in two countries... Emergency has been declared in New York State. Uh, Mayor Bloomberg of New York City... In a matter of seconds, 50 million people simply fall off the grid. Phone lines and water systems fail, and thousands of people are trapped in elevators and subways. Oh, people start to panic, you know, like, we couldn't breathe. It'll be okay, honey, it'll be all right. It is August 14th, 2003, and the largest blackout in North American history causes six billion in damages. The official cause? Overgrown trees on power lines. But there's more to this story than troublesome trees. Just three days earlier, on August 11th, someone, somewhere, released one of the most damaging computer viruses ever written. Blaster. It was probably the biggest attack against the internet ever. Nico Hippanen is one of the world's most respected virus hunters. It is here at F-Secure, an antivirus lab based in Helsinki. He and his team first identify Blaster when it hits the internet. What astonishes Miko is the impact the virus has on the physical world. Blaster was the first worm that really showed that an attack like this can affect society and the normal life. Air Canada passengers were frustrated by long check-in lineups today after a virus overwhelmed some of the airline's computer networks. As Blaster explodes across the net, Air Canada's check-in system shudders to a halt. And 3,000 kilometers south, Amtrak and CSX railroad services are disrupted, delaying train routes in 23 states. We saw planes stopping and trains stopping and boats stopping. We saw infections with military installations. And then, of course, three days later, there was the U.S. blackout. Did a computer virus some tribute to this? In the 21st century, most of us have had a run-in or two with a virus. They're usually the reason our computers act strangely or slow down. But Blaster was a new kind of threat. It used to be that viruses traveled the internet by piggybacking on other programs. They would arrive at your computer in the form of email attachments. The virus could not activate until someone opened the attachment. But Blaster was a worm. Worms don't need other programs. They propel themselves through the net. And they are self-activating. In other words, you could get Blaster simply by being connected. You would get infected just by having your PC online. You could be sleeping and your machine would get infected. Which meant anything connected was susceptible. Systems like the financial network, water treatment centers, and power plants. In one case, we know that a virus got into the major nuclear reactor in Ohio. Nine months after the blackout, the official report stated that Blaster, despite being released just three days earlier, played no significant role in causing the huge shutdown. Some security experts remained unconvinced, pointing to more than just the timing of the two events. If you read the blackout transcripts of the operators who were in the middle of this when it was happening, what keeps coming up in the transcripts is, is comments that, you know, stuff isn't moving there, there's screens for freezing, which is exactly what the blaster worm does. 
Whether the blaster virus caused the 2003 blackout remains a contentious issue. But after blaster, no one doubted that online viruses could cause real-world damage. It's been actually a real learning exercise for potential attackers and terrorists to see, oh, well, if an accident can cause this, maybe we could cause it as well. Eric Byers is a former instructor at the British Columbia Institute of Technology. He researches the dangers of connecting critical infrastructure to the Internet. There's no question that you could build a virus um, to take down the critical infrastructure. For example, our power systems, our water systems, our transportation systems, if those go away, our life radically changes. Today, most critical systems are connected to the Internet. And the computers these utilities use are the same Windows-based PCs that you might have in your kitchen. 95% of the machines are running Microsoft Windows. So when you have some sort of a worm or a virus or some sort of threat spreading that affects Windows, it spreads like wildfire. A Canadian oil company um, came to us and said, you know, we have this, this big infrastructure and we're curious, you know, can somebody uh, attack this? So Eric went to work. Using only a laptop and some basic hacker software, he easily broke into the holding tanks at the company's refinery. So, first of all, I'm going to do what's called cutoff visibility. Now I've fooled it so that the uh, operator doesn't know anything's, anything's going wrong. And then I'm actually going to blow up the tank farm. And you can see that all of a sudden, this pump has just gone nuts. And pretty soon, that tank's going to be overflowing. And in real life, uh, somebody be walking around with an oil spill. I wish that I could say, nope, um, all our critical infrastructure is secure, but it's not. If connecting power plants and oil refineries to the Internet is putting them at risk, why not leave them unplugged? For business, for business reasons, for business efficiency. Mary Kerwin is a security consultant and a columnist for the Globe and Mail. One executive interviewed said that he thought it was, it was fine, it was worth taking the risk so they'd have an edge on the competition by having these open, insecure hookups between the utilities and, uh, and the corporate network. The problem, the Internet was never designed to be secure. It was never actually built to do a lot of the things we're using it for right now. Uh, it was not meant to be an engine of commerce. It was not meant to hold your banking information. In the late 1960s, researchers began developing a network that could share information between computers. In the 90s, it went public and exploded. It was no longer just a handful of scientists on the Internet. It was now anyone with a modem. When you have 25 people on a network, you can be pretty sure they're going to play well. But when you've got 2 billion people on a network, you can be pretty sure that somebody is not playing fair. There are no secure computers. Uh, there are no secure networks. Amit Yoran is the former director of cybersecurity within the U.S. Department of Security. I think sooner or later, uh, we are going to be hit by a cyber failure uh, that will affect uh, either our nation's infrastructure or international infrastructures in a very significant and harmful way. So the implication is, is that somebody remotely managed to gain access to these control systems and does that type of damage and leaves the economy at a standstill, essentially, because without our ability to bank online, to make a phone call, to switch on the lights. We're literally in the dark. Like most viruses, Blaster had no specific target. Its damage was collateral, releasing it an act of cyber vandalism. Something a kid might do. Most of the time when these guys get grabbed, they get grabbed, it was just for sport or their pals or they were sitting in their schoolroom in Germany and somebody annoyed them so they decided to play a game and write viruses or whatever. So usually they have uh, 
particularly the kids, they have no clue of what they're doing, and that's why they can be very dangerous. They're called hackers. Some would say they're nothing more than hobbyists, kids mostly. But hackers grow up too. We are the people that, that are behind the scenes of everything that you take for granted on the internet. It's us. There are three types. The white hats are the good guys. They're the virus hunters or the IT people at your office. The black hats are the bad ones. The virus writers or the crooks who try to steal your credit card line. And then, somewhere in the middle, are the gray hats. They work both sides of the street, guns for hire in a Wild West industry. Tell us who you work for, Donnie. <laughs> oh, let's go somewhere else right now. Donnie makes his living as a professional hacker. Exactly how, he won't say. He is sometimes hired by companies to hack into their own systems. It's called penetration testing. That's where you get permission to break in, just as a real hacker would, but you are under a contract, and that's so that they can identify their security flaws and fix those security flaws before a bad guy really does. Like most professional hackers, Donnie has an infamous past. I was approached initially by this company in India. They wanted a demonstration of my skill set, so to speak. I ended up compromising um, five different systems with five different um, exploit vectors. Looking further into one of the intrusions, I had indeed broken into mail.gov.in. For all intents and purposes, I took down their government infrastructure. I had free reign on, on the systems all I wanted. I was able to plant back doors and gain later access. I was able to um, read emails. I was able to um, record keystrokes. In hacker parlance, we would say that I owned India. I, I owned a small country. Not, no, not small. I own the second largest country in the world. We asked Donnie to demonstrate his skills.